Silent Witch Extra Story 1, Romance and Tale Azeroth GT Silent Witch June 8, 2021 5 minutes sitting on the fluffiest bed she's ever had and wearing a silk nightgown she's never slept in before, Monica flipped through the pages of her novel, feeling uncomfortable with the intense stare she was receiving. After reaching the last page of the book, Monica let out a breath and rubbed her tired eyes. At that moment, Isabel, who had been sitting by the bedside the whole time, spoke up with a gleam in her eye. What did you think? Maron Philo's masterpiece, The White Rose Maiden Sleeps in the Garden, W. Well, Monica was at a loss for words to reply, letting her gaze wander around. T. The phrasing is, rather unique, isn't it? Indeed, Maron Philo uses poetic language very beautifully, and above all, her descriptions of the scenes in the heroine's psychology are wonderful. The story is superb, too. The parting scene in the third chapter is unforgettable, and you can't read it without shedding tears. Monica, who had read that very third chapter without tears, felt very sorry for her. Monica, who has not been used to reading stories since her childhood, has difficulty understanding this kind of unique expression in fictional stories. For example, white skin as smooth as white porcelain, black hair like melted ebony dusted with jewels, and lips as fresh as wild strawberries, all of which would be fine with just white skin, black hair, and red lips, but still, she could not bring herself to deny what was recommended to her, so she smiled vaguely while giving some feedback. Then Isabel's chambermaid, Agatha, spoke softly to her. My lady, it is almost time for dinner, oh my, it's already time for dinner. Well then, big sister Monica, I will be leaving for the dining hall in a little while. I'll have Agatha prepare a meal for you, T thank you, as she thanked her, Monica let out a sigh of relief. After getting drugged by Miss Caroline and sent to the infirmary. Monica took a few days off from class to recuperate in Isabel's room. Monica didn't mind being in the attic, but Isabel had already brought a bed into her room for her, so she could not refuse. To be honest, Monica, who was not used to living with other people, couldn't help but feel restless, but her chambermaid, Agatha, dealt with the situation skillfully. Whenever Isabel got too excited, Agatha would subtly correct her. Even now, Agatha ushered Isabel into the dining room and brought Monica a tray with food on it. I'll leave your meal over here. Please ring this bell when you are done, T. Thank you, Agatha smiled, bowed, and left the room. She appreciated the concern, knowing that Monica was not used to eating in a public place. Monica climbed out of bed and sat down in a chair. On the table were soft bread, cheese sautéed fish, potage, and sweetened apples. Agatha had gone to the trouble of preparing all of them for Monica in the dining room. Grateful for Isabel's and Agatha's thoughtfulness, Monica sliced a piece of bread and brought it to her mouth. The fluffy white bread was soft with a slight sweetness. Such soft bread was not something she could eat very often in the mountains. The one Monica was eating at the cabin was black bread hard as a stone. It was delicious when eaten with cheese, though. As she chewed on the bread and reminisced about her life in the cabin, she heard the sound of scratchings on the window. Looking over, it was actually Nero scratching at the window. Monica stood up and opened the window, allowing Nero to easily enter the room before he twitched his nose. It smells good, I have some fish. You want some, I don't like fish, you know. I prefer meat. I like birds, especially birds, as soon as Nero jumped up on the desk and saw that there was no meat, he frowned in frustration and said, these cheese will do for now, once she placed a small plate of cheese in front of Nero, he took a bite of the cheese, seeming to really like the taste, it's so good, now if we could only get some meat, it would be perfect, hey, I think I'll go hunting again tonight. After all the fuss over the bird bone stuck in your throat, that was just a youthful indiscretion. Wise creatures grow day by day by repeating mistakes like that. 
Nero nodded plausibly and wagged his tail when he noticed that there was a novel on Monica's bedside table. It's unusual for you to read a novel. Oh, I get it. The Orange Rose recommended it to you, didn't she? You're being rude to Lady Isabel. The Orange Rose must be referring to Isabel's hair. Nero basically never tried to remember people's names. Despite Monica's protests, Nero was still gazing at the cover of the novel as he bit into a piece of cheese. That's a writer I don't know. Hey, was that novel interesting? I wasn't sure. How's the story? Looking at Nero's curious eyes, Monica tore off a piece of bread as she ruminated on the story she had just finished reading. Comma there was a man and a woman. Okay, a lot of things happened. Oh ho, they're getting married. Then, the end. Nero's tail stopped moving and he stared up at Monica. I understand now that you weren't too a bit impressed by the novel. But, that a lot of things happen part is what's important. You've omitted hundreds of thousands of words, because I really didn't know any of this. That novel told the story of the unfortunate heroine who meets a young nobleman by a rose tree and falls in love with him at first sight. However, the young man had a fiancé. When his fiancée refuses to acknowledge the breakup of the engagement, she schemes to get rid of the heroine, but the two overcome their ordeal and end up together. However, Monica can't understand why the heroine and the young nobleman fell in love, in the first place. The young man had a fiancée, so the fiancée had every right to be furious. Comma how could she become so infatuated over someone like this? The characters in the story were infatuated with the other person as if they were drowning. They were madly in love with each other. They want to love and be loved. They want to choose or want to be chosen, no matter how much it costs them. This seemed somewhat frightening to Monica. Kama how can someone expect so much, from another person? Nero's tail wagged in response to the muttering, and he looked up at Monica with golden eyes. I guess you're too young to understand. Love is like, when you fall, your heart skips a beat. Like, a zap, Monica stared at Nero, who said with a knowing look on his face. Comma so, do you know what love is, Nero, of course I am. I like females with sexy tails, by the way, tail, I can't lust after a female without a tail, so you're out of my scope. So don't worry. It was a world that Monica, who had no tail, could not understand. Maybe, just like Monica herself didn't have a tail, she didn't have any interest in love in the first place. Satisfied with that conclusion, Monica tore off a piece of bread and stuffed it into her mouth. It's a matter of not knowing what love is. The timid Monica can't hope for anyone or anything. She can't expect anything. What she wanted madly was just a number that would never betray her. Extra Story 2, Scholar Family, Mediator Family Azareth GT Silent Witch June 12, 2021 10 minutes The Ashley family has been known as the Scholar Family for generations, but they originally were a family of librarians. Perhaps as a remnant of their legacy, the Ashley family owned a library and three study rooms. The number of books in the library was no less than the library in the royal capital. Claudia who growing up surrounded by such an enormous amount of books, naturally would read them in her spare time. The adults around her called her a book-loving girl, but Claudia wasn't particularly fond of reading. She has a slightly different hobby. For Claudia, the act of reading a book was a natural act. Just as eating when hungry. She reads books when she doesn't know something. That was all there was to it. And for that reason, Claudia thought the act of reading no more than that. The same can be said for the rest of Ashley's family members. And Claudia's father was no exception. Therefore, her scholar father, Marcus Hyen, was visited every day by those who sought his advice. Some were representing their own people, some were local nobles and some were from other countries. Come I'm in trouble because my fields are not yielding. Please tell me how to grow more crops even in a drought. Come it's about inheritance property control. Please tell me how to get an upper hand over my brother. 
Comma, a sailor became ill during a voyage. Please tell me how to treat it. Everyone was clinging on to her father, saying, Please tell me, please tell me. As she watched such scenes, the child Claudia thought to herself, Why do these people never try to figure things out for themselves? Most of the questions they brought up were things that could be found in a book. No one ever bothered to figure it out themselves. They only want to know the answer. Claudia was experiencing the same things as well. In her primary school, people would come to Claudia to ask her about things they didn't understand. Treating her like nothing more than a walking library, everyone also thought of all the Ashley family members was like that. It would be worse when they felt grateful to her. After they felt grateful for Claudia because she could be relied upon, they would back to ask on her again, and again. That's why Claudia despised their gratitude. So, when people tried to talk to her, Claudia would show her gloomy face as if she didn't feel like talking to them. Its gloomy was like that of a person who seemed to have one of her family members died. Its effect was so great making no one came near Claudia after, leaving her with plenty time to read a book quietly. Claudia was truly happy about that. One day, a letter arrived at her father's door. A certain baron wanted to visit her father to ask for his advice on something. After her father read the letter, his face was expressionless but somewhat jubilant, she sure for it. He even arranged for the servants to prepare a reception for that person. Kama who's our guest today, after begin asked by Claudia, her father lifted his glasses and spoke up. Baron Maywood would like to discuss something with me, he's come to ask some advice, isn't he? But you seem quite enthused about it, even arranged the servants to receive that person, in response to his daughter's bitter remark, her father muttered, I see as he expected her reply. To an outsider, he may look cold and impassive, but to his family, his excitement was apparent. The corners of his mouth were slightly raised under his well-trimmed beard. Baron Maywood always comes to me for advice when he's done looking everything within his means before seeking a different point of view. He's not come to seek for my wisdom, but my opinion. The wine I drink always tastes better when I've him accompany me, said her father, concluding the story. Claudia knew that her father did not like to drink very much. To be able to make such a father enjoying his drink, Baron Maywood must be an outstanding man like no other, she thought at the time. Well, it's nice to see you, Marcus Hyen. It's been a long time. Oh, is that Miss Claudia over there? She looks very lovely. Claudia's first impression of Baron Maywood was one word, plain. He appeared to be younger than her father, and his clothes were plain with few ornaments. He probably a Baron who wasn't from a wealthy family. The smile on his face was somewhat unreliable with his relaxed eyebrows, making him look amicably and not very smart. I brought my son with me today. Neil, introduce yourself, as Baron Maywood urged. A small boy stepped out from behind, looked straight up at Marcus Hyen with a shy smile, then greeted him. My name is Neil Clay Maywood, eldest son of Baron Maywood. It is an honor to meet you, he was a boy with straight eyes. Though he only appeared to be about ten years old, he was said to be thirteen, the same age as Claudia. Apparently, looking young was their family trait. Ushered into the parlor by Claudia's father which was Marcus Hyen, together with Baron Maywood, had a brief discussion. The topic was mainly about the mediation between the Magician's Association and the Noble Council. Apparently, the Magician's Association has requested the Council to lift the ban on medical spells. And Baron Maywood's task to arbitrate the meeting. For generations. The Baron Maywood family has been involved mainly in mediating these kinds of negotiations. If the Marcus Hyen family was known as the Scholar family, then Baron Maywood's family was known as the Mediator family, despite his position as a noble, a mediator's job is to guide the two sides of the debate to reach a satisfactory settlement in an impartial manner, without taking sides with the noble council. Lifting the ban on medical spells would certainly save some lives. That's a fact. 
However, in my opinion, it is still too early. We need both medical and spells research development to reach the same level of maturity. But, medical development in this country is not mature yet, I agree. In some areas, there are still doctors who use superstition as a form of medicine. Lifting the ban on medical spells in this situation will only add to the actions of such frauds, first of all, the bad effect of mana in the human body. I think we need to do more verification of that. The data we've collected on the part of the Magicians Association is still insufficient. If things continue like this, the medical development may be eclipsed by the magic development, definitely. On top of that, we should train those who are proficient in both medicine and spells. I am certain medical spells will be developing in the future, but at the moment, the foundation for it has not even been laid. So, we should concentrate on cultivating the soil, you are right. However, hearing someone has a family member with a disease that is untreatable by today's medical treatment, tend to make me get emotional in mediating. The ban on medical spells should be lifted as soon as possible. Are you trying to kill my daughter when someone said that? It made me felt so depressed. I understand how painful it is to feel that way. If the wrong method of treatment caused mana poisoning and led her to death, there would be no saving the child. Yeah, that's why we should proceed more carefully, as she quietly listened to the conversation between her father and Baron Maywood. Baron Maywood turned his head and looked at Claudia. He then relaxed his eyebrows and smiled wryly. Sorry, that wasn't very interesting, was it? No, I found it very interesting. I can tell the arguments of the magicians, who are trying to push their case based on emotionalism without sufficient data, and the noble council, who are concerned that the interests of the medical association will flow into the magicians if doctors and magicians team up, Baron Maywood rounded his eyes slightly at Claudia's words. However, he didn't seem particularly offended, and rather calmly relaxing his eyebrows and smiled. You're very clever. Indeed. It precisely because of that I need to proceed more carefully, before making my decision, Neil, who was sitting next to Baron Maywood, rounded his eyes and looked at Claudia. He must have been taken aback by Claudia's statement. I don't know how much the little boy with the young face understands my words, he even might not able to understand everything. As Claudia was thinking about this, her father glanced at her and said in a low voice. Claudia. Go give young Neil a tour of our mansion. Her father probably thought Claudia was bored, too. She suspected the topics they would talk about would be things that can't be heard by children. Um, please treat me well. This is like I've become a person who's showing the way for children. Claudia thought to herself. Comma any place do you want to see? Um, I want to see your garden. Okay, for him being interested in gardens rather than books in the Ashley family, which boasts such a large collection of books, was quite unusual. Claudia led Neil into the garden, secretly thinking that it would be easier for her if he would just stay quiet and read a book. Having walked next to each other for a while, she found him looked even younger. He was a little shorter than Claudia and his appearance didn't match his age. Noticing Claudia was giving him a side glance, Neil then responded with a smile which much like his father. You are amazing, Miss Claudia. You even grasped the true meaning behind such a difficult event. I haven't thought about the reason behind the Noble Council. I didn't expect the Medical Association and the Noble Council have a strong connection. My father let me present to be the meeting was to study, but I'm not ready yet, apparently. He barely able to grasp the meaning behind their father's were discussion. Neil folded his arms groaning with a difficult face. I wonder if there was any proof that clearly shows the connection between the Noble Council and the Medical Association. The current head of the Medical Association is, um, Neil was groaning as question after question came from him, never once asked about them to Claudia. Unexpectedly, Claudia opened her mouth. Comma you're not going to ask, huh, I am the daughter of Marcus Hyen. The scholar family. 
I have enough wisdom to answer most of your questions. In fact, Claudia has all the answers to the questions that Neil had mentioned. However, Neil showed a slight sign of thinking and then shook his head firmly. No, I will look it up when I get home. If you don't know something, you should look it up yourself. If you still can't figure it out, ask someone who can. That's what my father told me. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for refusing while you've intended to answer my questions. But, Claudia didn't say she would answer his questions. She just said that she knew the answer. However, this apparently good-natured boy seemed to have interpreted Claudia's statement as one of the good intentions. I'm going to do some investigation at home, so if I still don't understand, please do tell me. Claudia did not confirm or deny. It wasn't that she was being mean. It was because she couldn't decide which was the best response. If she told him there's no way I would give you my answer, or something in a cold tone, perhaps that boy will never visit her again. And she felt like she would regret it later. Opened the door without a word, Claudia was walking straight down the well-marked path. Comma we've arrived in our garden, wow, there's a lot of medical herbs. Marcus Hyen family has half of his garden planted with ornamental flowers and half with medicinal herbs. While the latter was grown by her father as a way to put into practice his knowledge on medicinal herbs. Her father was a man who believed that this kind of knowledge was only valuable if it was put into practice. Marcus Hyen has aired that man of a taciturn knowledgeable man, but he was surprisingly a man of action. Look at this, Miss Claudia. This herb. It's the kind that helps with cut wounds, how could I possibly not know? Well, you're right, scratching his cheek in embarrassment, Neil crouched down on the spot and reached for a weed growing outside the flower bed. Then do you what is this, it's weeds, she could even tell him its scientific name if he wanted. Along with its habitats, too. In front of the thinking Claudia, Neil plucked a weed and snapped both its edges put it in his mouth then blew on it. Whistle a high-pitched sounded. If you cut this grass here and squeeze this area, you can make whistles. Our shepherds often do this, I've never heard about it before. As Claudia spoke quietly, Neil giggled and blew his grass flute happily. The sound was high, clear, and pleasant. As soon as Baron Maywood and his son went out to return to their home, Claudia immediately made an announcement to her father. Father, I would like to marry Neil. Claudia said this with her usual gloomy air, but Marcus Hine neither surprised nor scolded her, simply stared at her in silence. After staring at each other in silence for a while, Marcus Hyen slowly opened his mouth. Neil is the eldest son who will inherit the Maywood family, so I can't make him come to her house as my son-in-law. Claudia thought her father would continue with his denial thereafter. But when he playing with his mustache, he blurted out. I guess I would have to adopt a son to take over the family. Claudia's mother died soon after giving birth to Claudia, and her father never took a second wife. So at this point, Claudia was the only person in the direct line of the Marcus Hyen family. Certainly, if he adopted the son who would succeed the Marcus Hyen family, Claudia would be able to marry Neil off without any problems. However, she knew her father wished to have come into his house as his son-in-law. So you do not disagree with it, I know you'll come to love him. The words that her father said as he tried to hold his tongue were filled with a strange sense of reality. Indeed, both father and daughter have a weakness for the Baron Maywood family. Marcus Hyen did not mention the fact that the blood of the direct lineage of the scholar family would be cut off. He also knew that knowledge was not passed down by their blood, but education. Now, I should make some arrangements for an adoption. I'd like him to be a person whose desire to improve oneself, even if he's from a distant family. After saying this, Marcus Hyen took out one document after another from his writing desk. Claudia, the daughter, wanted to marry him the next day after the meeting, and her father who heard her daughter yearning for that marriage of a sudden, immediately started preparing documents for adoption and engagement. Like the father like the daughter, 
Their quick decisions were so similar. Extra Story 3 The Girl Who Ran Away to the World of Numbers Azareth GT Silent Witch July 17, 2021 4 minutes for some period of time, Monica had forgotten how to understand human speech. When her father died, her uncle took her in, and Monica lived in fear of him every day. Her uncle hated Monica's father, no, you could say he loathed him. Whenever her uncle spoke ill of her father, Monica desperately tried to refute him. It wasn't my father's fault, she said. So every time Monica opened her mouth, her uncle would throw his fist at her. Shut up. Stop talking nonsense. His fists would swing down along with his curses. In the worst cases, she would get kicked in the stomach and beaten with a chair. Sometimes meals were taken away from her, which was not uncommon. Whenever she went out, people in town would talk behind her back. All they wished for was how bad her father was. Her mind and body were slowly being worn down little by little. Gradually, Monica found herself escaping into the world of numbers when times were tough. When her uncle beat her, or when she was forced into the barn in the middle of winter, Monica would just repeat in her head the formulas from the books she read in her father's study. In this way, she can forget the pain in her body in the cold of winter. After some time of escaping into the world of numbers, Monica's perception began to become distorted. At first, she couldn't recognize people's faces anymore. The size of the eyes, the width of each eye, the angle of the corners of the eyes, the length, width, and height of the nose, the angle of the chin, she can recognize these in numbers, but she cannot recognize them as a human face. To Monica, a person's face was nothing but a mass of numbers. Next, she could no longer recognize human expressions. When her uncle got angry, his eyebrows would move this much, his mouth would open this much, the angle of his mouth would change by this many degrees. His eyebrows would move this many times in three seconds, everything would be converted into numbers. However, Monica could not recognize the anger that her uncle's face meant. All Monica could understand was the number of how many parts of his face had moved. Her uncle had kicked the desk, and the desk moved this much, so the amount of force needed to move, and so on as her mind began to calculate the numbers. But Monica couldn't understand why her uncle had kicked the desk. All Monica could understand was the numerical value of the force needed of the kicked desk. By the end of it, she couldn't recognize human speech. She could understand what her uncle was saying, but her mind could not perceive the meaning of his words. Since she can't understand what was being said, Monica combined the number of sounds into a mathematical equation, calculated it and let the result leak out of her mouth. When his uncle saw Monica mumbling those numbers, he kicked her, saying she was creepy. Not recognizing what had been said to her, Monica calculated how many seconds it would take for her nosebleed to coagulate. And so, by the time a year had passed since her uncle took her in, Monica had become so broken that she could not recognize anything but numbers. She simply immersed herself in the world of beautiful formulas that never hurt her, turned her eyes away from reality. Her body grew to the point where it was barely able to survive, and her originally thin body became as thin as a stick. In such a situation, a woman reached out to Monica. She was Hilda Everett, a mid-thirties woman in glasses with short auburn hair who used to be her father's assistant. I've been looking for you ever since Dr. Rain died. Hilda said in a calm voice as she covered Monica, who was freezing after being kicked out of the house by her uncle, with her own scarf. But Monica can't perceive those words. All she could understand were the numbers. As she muttered the exact number of letters of the words she had heard and applied them to the equation, Hilda smiled softly and stroked Monica's cheek. So Dr. Wayne had taught you the formulas, and at your age. You're already so proficient on it, you don't deserve to be here. Come with me, Monica, Monica, when was the last time someone called me by my first name wondered Monica at that word. After all, her uncle never called her by name but trash or dimwit. 
She hadn't heard his father's name in a long time, since everyone had treated it as a taboo to be spoken. Her own name, her father's name, brought Monica's consciousness, which had been wandering in the world of numbers, to the surface. Come in my name, the name my dad gave me. Monica Rain, Hilda hugged the bruised and battered Monica, looking like she was about to cry. Dr. Rain would be very sad to see you like this, Dad. 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 That person didn't punch or kick her when she uttered the word Dad. She just mourned her father's death and hugged Monica affectionately. That brought her so much happiness. My dad wasn't wrong. My dad was. My dad was. I know. Dr. Rain was an outstanding man. My father was burned. And all of his study. All of them. As Monica's body quivered, Hilda's arms tightened around her body. That alone was enough to convey how sad this woman was over the death of her father. Sniff sniff your wah Dot. Monica cried aloud for the first time in a long time in Hilda's arms. That scene was like that of a whimpering young child. The next day, Monica became the adopted daughter of Hilda Everett, a researcher at the Magic Institute who later discovered her talent for magic and sent her to Magician Training Institute Minerva. And this story took place about five years ago when Monica was still 12 years old. Extra Story 4, Barney Jones Azareth GT Silent Witch July 19, 2021 13 minutes. Barney Jones was the second son of Count Anvard, a historic and prominent family in the southwestern part of the Riddle Kingdom. In noble society, the second son or younger was always treated as a spare for his older brother. No matter how incompetent or stupid the older brother was, he will always be the one to inherit the family. Barney was aware that he was better than his brother. And, in reality, he was like that. After all, his grades and academics were good enough to impress his tutor, and above all, he had a talent for magic. However, the one who would inherit the family was not him of the second son, but his older brother. That was why he enrolled in Minerva, the best institute for training magicians. What he was aiming for was not just an advanced magician level, but the seven sages, the peak magician in the Riddle Kingdom. Once he became one of the seven sages, he will receive the title of Count Magician, which was equivalent to the rank of Count. It was a very high rank that grants you to have an audience with the king. That way, even Barney as the second son, would have a chance to prove his achievements to his father and brother. So Barney studied hard, and thanks to his hard work, he was ranked first in both classroom and practical skills. I'm not like my brother. I have my talents. He believed that even if he was the second son, he could find his own path to success. It was when Barney was 13 years old. When he returned from the study tour, he found one female student surrounded by several male students in the corner of the classroom. A recently enrolled female student named Monica Everett, a.k.a. the Mute Everett. She was a petite girl with a doll-like expressionless face, always silent and downcast. Apparently, the boys were intrigued by Monica's inability to speak and were trying to toy with her. They were excited to see who could make Monica talk. One of the boys picked up a spider from the windowsill and brought it close to Monica's face. Monica remained downcast and did not react at all. Hey, pry this guy's mouth open. I'm gonna shove this in her mouth. I bet she'd scream if I did, in response to the boy's voice. The other boys reached for Monica's face, but those hands were pulled back just before they could. The boys' cuffs were burning with puffs of smoke. Ah ah. W-H what is this? What are you planning to do with her? The boys clicked their tongues blatantly when Barney said coldly, after unleashing his fire spell we're in the good part. Don't interrupt us, honor student, your behavior is so unbecoming of the noble. You should be ashamed of yourself. The boys snapped when he said this while lifting the rim of his trademark glasses. But Barney didn't hesitate to use a shortened chant, quick spell, and surrounded the boys with flaming arrows. The boys backed away with the winds, and Barney snickered at them. 
Do you really think you can beat a guy like me who is the best in practical skills? Barney was the sole genius in his grade who had mastered shortened chant. In the magic match, the speed of chanting plays a vital role. Therefore, no one could compete with Barney, who had mastered it. The boys clicked their tongues and walked out of the classroom. Barney snapped his fingers to dispel the flaming arrows and turned his eyes to Monica. Can you stand? Monica was staring blankly at the floor with her olive eyes. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the spider that the boys had thrown. Eventually, as the spider began to scurry and escape out the window, Monica raised her eyes blankly to Barney. Thank you. Despite her awkward speech, the mute Everett seems to be able to speak properly. Secretly surprised by this, Monica continued with her words that were difficult to ignore. Comma for seven, that Spryder, wait a minute, why did it become like that? He did not do that to save the spider, but Monica. He involuntarily squinted through his glasses to glare at Monica. Unfortunately, I hate bugs. So, what I saved was not a spider, but you. Monica blinked slowly in response and tilted her head to the side. She pondered for a while as if searching for words, and then started to speak slowly. I'm not afraid of spiders, huh? Monica's face remained expressionless as she mumbled to an astonished Barney. Upon looking at her again, he was struck by how expressionless she was. Her face was plain and simple, and if she smiled, she might be as charming as anyone else but other than the occasional blink, her face hardly moved at all. Monica was silent with a blank expression, but eventually, she spoke in a whisper, hardly moving her mouth. Comma but I'm glad, that you saved, the spider. Because it would have been, pitiful, if it had gone into my mouth, what kind of logic is that? Monica nodded without expression when Bernie expressed his dismay. Bernie scratched his cheek and asked a question that was bothering him. The way of you speak sounds so awkward. Did you come from another kingdom? Monica shook her head with a blank expression. Apparently, she was not a foreigner. I am sorry. I've been practicing speaking with my adoptive mother, but her words trailed off before taking a deep breath. It was as if a person who had forgotten how to speak had remembered how to breathe. I hadn't spoken, for a long time, so, I couldn't speak, fluently, she hadn't been speaking for a long time, which meant there must be circumstances behind it. Looking at her pale face and body, which was too thin compared to Barney, who was the same age as her, he could somehow guess that her circumstances had been harsh in their own way. Barney bent down in front of Monica and reached out his hand. Can you stand? Monica widened her eyes and looked at Barney's hands. Then, she hastily squeezed the pocket of her uniform. Um, I don't have a lot of money. Barney's cheeks twitched. Please don't look down on me. I'm a proud member of the Jones family. I would never extort money from you. Barney grabbed Monica's hand to help her to her feet, but she was still somewhat dazed, looked like a doll that had just been pulled by a puppeteer. Her eyes rounded slightly when Barney brushed the dust off Monica's robe. It was a very slight change in expression. However, he was strangely happy to see the change in the expression of this doll-like girl. You really are quite a handful, aren't you? I'm sorry, you should be thankful for that. No, when Barney said that, Monica's lips moved slightly, murmuring. It was too subtle to be called a smile but the corners of her mouth were certainly lifted just a little bit. Comma thank, you, you're welcome. From that day on, Barney began to look after Monica in any way he could. Monica was a real klutz, falling down in the middle of nowhere, getting her hair all shaggy, losing her personal belongings all the time, she simply couldn't take care of herself. Academically, she was as good as Barney at magic formulas and anything involving numbers, but her grades in general education were abysmal. Especially in history and languages, it was devastating. I guess it can't be helped, so said Barney, opening his notes before giving her explanation.
and Monica thanked Barney in a hushed voice in response. In this way, as they studied together every day, Monica's speech gradually became more fluent and her facial expressions became more expressive. Whenever she got in trouble, Monica would cry out to Bernie with her eyebrows downcast, and when he fixed her shaggy hair, she would give him a smile like a blooming wildflower. He was the one who had changed Monica. Barney felt some pride in it. Comma thanks, Barney, 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 help me e, you're incredible, Barney. Those little words of Monica's always fill Barney's pride. While the truth, he's got a faintly conscious from it. When Monica's hair was messy, it was because her classmates had cut it by force. When her personal belongings went missing, it was because they were being hidden. Nevertheless, Barney averted his eyes from this fact and continued to take care of Monica. Surely he subconsciously hoped that Monica would isolate herself. Because the more isolated Monica got, the more she relied on him. That way, he could continue to be a dependable honor student. While Minerva, an institution for training magicians, taught practical spells as a matter of course, the students were forbidden to actually use spells during the first six months of their enrollment. A spell was a powerful weapon that could wreak havoc if used in the wrong way. That's why it took at least six months to learn the fundamentals before moving on to practical training. Barney has been attending Minerva since he was seven years old, and by the time he was 13, he had mastered all of the intermediate spells and was able to use some of the advanced spells as well. Above all, he was the only person in his grade who had mastered shortened chant. Therefore, in practical training, he was unbeatable. Monica, on the other hand, has only been in school for a short time and has only recently begun to learn the basics. Barney was convinced that Monica's understanding of magic formulas was so high that once she learned how to manipulate Mana, she would catch up with him in no time. However, in her first practical class, how long are you going to stand still, even though the teacher urged her to do so, Monica only turned pale and quivered her lips. Eventually, the class ended without her even being able to chant, let alone use a spell. When recess came, Barney closed in on Monica. What the hell was that? Didn't you get the theory perfectly, Bebot? I was too scared to speak out in front of so many people. Then Barney finally remembered. Monica was now able to speak more normally in front of him, but she still couldn't talk to other people. I'm really scared when I speak in front of people. I'm scared that people will look at me the moment I say something. I'm scared of their stares. If you keep saying things like that, you won't be able to use magic no matter how long it takes. I know. Monica hung her head down with teary eyes. She must be really frustrated. After all, Barney had seen next to her how diligently she had studied for the past six months. I would like to do something about it, he thought, and a good idea came to his mind. Right, if you're bad at speaking up in front of people, you just have to reduce your chanting, eh, I'll teach you shortened chant. With it, you could cut the chanting time in half, since it would be easier on you, right, at Barney's suggestion, Monica fidgeted, kneading her fingers, letting her gaze wander. But, do you think I can do it? I'm sure you can do it. I know how much you've studied the fundamentals, and I'm sure you'll be able to understand the shortened chant in no time. When Barney said this in an unusually passionate tone, Monica's cheeks flushed red in response, and she nodded her head. I'll do my best, he <laughs> he, you really can be dependent, Barney, HMPH, of course. After all, I am the man who will become the seven sages in the future said Barney as he puffed out his chest and Monica smilingly nodded in response. Yet, yeah, I'm sure you can become one of the seven sages. You're an amazing person, after all, Monica's naive admiration tickled Barney's heart. He thought his path to a bright future was clear. And Barney never doubted that. Yet, for now. In the classroom of the practical class, a gasp filled the air. Everyone was speechless watching the scene in front of them as if they were glued to it. 
This was an unprecedented feat that no one in this room had ever seen before. No chance spell. This was done by the girl who had failed the practical test the most. Monica Everett. What is this? I didn't know any of this. Monica raised one hand lightly, and a small whirlwind erupted, spiraling around and around. Throughout all of this, Monica's mouth remained shut. I never taught her any of this. Barney was stunned. The only thing he had taught Monica was how to shorten the chant. When they were alone, Monica was able to use shortened chant, and he assumed she would demonstrate it in this class. If she demonstrated the shortened chant, the people around her would surely look at her differently. If she did, Barney was going to proudly say that he was the one who taught Monica. But the scene that was happening in front of his eyes was more than just a shortened chant. This time, when Monica lifted her other arm, an arrow of ice was created. Again, without chant. She could also use other spells without chanting, even if it wasn't her favorite attribute, wind. She had enrolled in Minerva six months ago. And it had only been two weeks since she started her practical class. Monica Everett was a true genius, in a realm that could not be reached through hard work alone. That fact was drowning Barney with despair. While Monica looked at him with admiration, Barney felt deep anger and jealousy. If Barney hadn't been there, she wouldn't have been able to have a proper conversation if Barney hadn't been there. She'd be all alone in class if Barney hadn't been there, she'd hardly be able to do anything. Feeling terribly betrayed, Barney gritted his teeth with his eyes staggered with jealousy behind the glasses. From the moment Monica demonstrated her no chance spell, the environment around her changed drastically. She was treated as a scholarship student and became a pupil of Professor Gideon Rutherford, one of Minerva's most distinguished professors. It was well known that most people who had studied under Professor Rutherford had been chosen as the Seven Sages. Rumored that Monica would eventually become one of them. Monica was now under the direct supervision of Professor Rutherford and rarely showed up for regular classes. This naturally meant that she had fewer opportunities to see Barney. Since the day Monica used her no chance spell, Barney has not spoken to Monica even once. On several occasions, Monica had tried to talk to him, but Barney had ignored them all. Barney's idea of a perfect future started to go haywire little by little from the time on. To shorten the distance between him and Monica, Barney trained tirelessly, but as a result, he suffered from mana poisoning and ended up in the infirmary. Struggling as the mana consumed his body, Barney felt so much hatred toward Monica. The reason why he was suffering so much was all because of Monica. Because of Monica, he has become this crazy. It's all Monica's fault. Comma Monica had ruined Barney's life. In the winter of her 15th year, Monica was chosen as one of the Seven Sages. The fact that the youngest of the Seven Sages had been chosen from Minerva students caused much excitement in the Academy. Especially on the day of the inauguration of the Seven Sages and its parade, the whole Academy was in an uproar. But all the cheering and praise for Monica was just irritating noises to Barney. He believed that even Barney, his brother Spare, would be recognized by the people around him if he mastered magic and became the Seven Sages. Barney never doubted that he could become one. But the person chosen as one of the Seven Sages was not Barney, but Monica. He was not even invited to the selection process. Barney, a voice called out to him when he was leaving Minerva's library. The person who was running up to him was Monica. Now that she was one of the seven sages, she can no longer be called a student of this school. She was wearing an indigo robe that only the seven sages were allowed to wear. The beautiful staff in her hand was also something that only the seven sages were allowed to hold. Monica hugged her staff to her chest and fidgeted with her fingers. Her childish gestures, her body that was too thin for her age, and her young face were no different from the Monica that Barney knew. But she was no longer Barney's friend. The, mute Everett, had become the, silent witch, of the Seven Sages. Um, F for a long time. I really want to thank you, Barney, 
Monica was stammering, trying her best to speak. But Barney coldly interrupted her. Are you mocking me? The Monica's expression froze. Oh, what a wonderful feeling is this thought him as he wanted to distort that face even more. You want to thank me? Ha ha, is that sarcasm? You must have been looking down on me, right, huh? W-I would I? No, I would never. I just thought that you were an important friend of mine. You're not my friend. Monica's eyes were wide open, and tears were slowly welling up in them. Feels hurt more, he thought. Monica should have gone to pieces, so shredded and tattered that she would never be able to recover again. You must be a detestable person to come all the way to see me in the formal attire of the Seven Sages. Does it make you feel good to make fun of me and look down on me like that hey, tell me, Miss Seven Sage, a teardrop falls from Monica's eye. Monica's nose turned red before she cried like a child. That miserable crying face, that crying voice, filled the hole inside Barney's heart just a little bit. What a shameful way to behave for one of the seven sages. Though, I don't consider you to be one of them. You'd be better off holed up in an isolated mountain cabin. Monica was slumped there, sobbing. Barney walked past her quickly, heading for his room. The pitiful cries that reached his ears made him feel better, if only slightly. After that incident, Barney never heard any more about the activities of the Silent Witch. Rumor has it that the Silent Witch lives a hermit-like life in a mountain cabin. Probably would never see Barney again. This is for the better. Thus, Barney Jones finally regained his peace of mind. Extra Story 5 Story of a Certain Boy and His Servant Azareth GT Silent Witch August 21st 2021 5 minutes a young boy, who was the owner of this elegant room, mumbling uncomprehendingly as he was looking at the necklace on the table. Occasionally, he would glance back and forth between the grimoire and the necklace in his hands, before placing his small palm on the necklace and chanting the spell that was written in the grimoire. Kama what are you doing, Lord, the servant boy, who had been silently watching his master asked in an indifferent voice to keep his dismay at bay. And the boy who had been staring at the necklace turned his head and looked back, in return. The teacher from basic magic class today told me that a spirit has resided in the necklace I've got from my mother, yes, I've heard Lady Irene has a good aptitude for magic and made a contract with a high-ranking spirit, then, won't my grandfather would be pleased if I could do the same thing as my mother. The boy's sky blue eyes gleamed, leaving his servant in complete loss. Oh, why is my master so dull witted? Hiding his thought, the servant quietly told him the cruel reality. I doubt your grandfather will be pleased, A, eh, to contract a high ranking spirit. You must have the same aptitude with the spirit you will make a contract with. But, Lord, you have different aptitude with the spirit Lady Irene had contracted with so it can't be achieved, in the first place, making a contract with a high-ranking spirit requires a huge amount of mana and the ability to understand magical formulas. The servant boy was inwardly exasperated, thinking why did he say that when he should have been taught this subject in his class. The boy hung his head down dejectedly, staring down at the necklace. That sight made the servant let out a sigh inwardly. After all, he didn't want to make his master sad. Lord, could you give me a moment? The servant flipped open his own jacket and pulled out a book that had been tucked on his back. Grown-up people would have been able to sneak a book under his jacket, but the servant was a boy not much older than his master. So, the only way to bring in a book without the adults finding out was to hide it in his jacket, tying it to his body. Here, take this. The boy's eyes lit up when he saw the title of the book the servant held out to him. It's an astronomy book by Mary Harvey, the Star Oracle Witch. I've been hearing you mention of wanting to read this book. Whoa. Thank you. I've been wanting to read that for ages. The boy hugged the book to his chest and jumped in delight, expressing his joy with his whole body. Normally, he would scold his master for his ill-mannered behavior, but... Only for this time, 
The servant boy feigned ignorance. The boy, master of the servant boy, had taken an interest in the stars in the night sky. However, the grown-ups always tried to keep such books away from him, saying that astronomy was not necessary for his future. That was why the servant boy had secretly procured the book, only to please his master, nothing more. You know, the star oracle witch is one of the seven sages. In fact, she's an amazing prophetess who can forecast the future of the country by watching the movement of the stars. It's said there are many fortune tellers in this country, but the only person who's been titled as the prophetess was the star oracle witch. Many said the color of the stars and the number of times they blink are important, considering that the color of the stars directly indicates the lifespan of the star. I regret to inform you but we should postpone this discussion until later. I believe the daughter of Marcus Shelbury should be arrived by now, so we should get ready. At the servant boy's words, his master pouted. Come and now that reminds me, I promised Bridget to accompany her in dancing practice today, but I don't feel like doing it. You know how bad I was at dancing. Bridget also gets really mad when I step on her feet. Besides I'm not very good at talking to girls. I would be nervous when doing so, which makes it hard to speak properly. I don't think it's appropriate to say such a thing to your future fiancé. Of course, I won't dare to say that in public. I did so because it was you. The boy took a deep breath jovially, hugging the book which he had received from the servant like a treasure. That night. The boy was summoned to his grandfather's room but stood stunned by the scene before him. Kneeling at his grandfather's feet was the servant boy whom the boy looked up to like a brother. He was wearing nothing on his upper body, and his white back was severely swollen with whip marks from the chastisement. Gee grandfather. W.Y.E. I've got a report that this mongrel had brought you something unnecessary. My grandfather then directed his gaze to a book on the table. It was a book that the servant boy had secretly procured for him. How? I've had it hidden in my room for sure thought the boy in shock. Come I I'm sorry, it was my fault. I was the one who forced him to bring that book. In other words, he's not following my orders, but yours? How dare a servant like him mistakenly identify his master, with that? His grandfather swung the whip down to the servant's back. The servant, who was not much older than a boy, gritted his teeth to endure the pain without uttering a single word. Please stop, I beg you, grandfather, please stop, I will never again ask for any more astronomy books. So please, throw that book in the fireplace. After he was ordered by his grandfather, the boy picked up the book on the desk and stood in front of the fireplace. Then, with trembling hands, he tossed his precious book, which the servant boy had taken secretly only for the sake of pleasing his master, into the fireplace. Trying to hold back the tears as he watched the letters burning up, his grandfather revealed another his misconduct in a low voice. I heard today's dance lesson was a disaster, I am sorry, there was a sharp snapping sound as the whip was swung down again. But it was aimed not to the boy. But to the back of the kneeling servant boy, his grandfather knew all too well, it was more effective to hurt the servant whom the boy adored like a brother than to hurt the boy himself. You've brought shame upon me in the eyes of Marcus Shelbury, I am sorry, I'm sorry. I'll do it properly next time. I promise I won't embarrass you again. So, please, after pleading with tears in his eyes to stop whipping the servant. His grandfather delivered a whip for the last time with a single, loud snap. Even so, the servant boy did not scream and held on. There won't be next time, yes, after the boy nodded his head tremblingly, his grandfather cast a cold stare, more frigid than a winter lake, at his badly behaved grandson and spat. To think such a failure is Irene's son, how deplorable, extra story 6. Ashley Siblings Tea Party as Earth GT Silent Witch September 23, 2021 9 minutes Cyril Ashley was not the kind of person who took the initiative to hold a tea party. But just two days before the school festival, 
he rented one of the private tea rooms in the school. Moreover, he only invited one person, and that's his sister Claudia Ashley. Both siblings were not the type who would have a friendly and harmonious chat at a tea party. In other words, he invited her to talk in private in the name of a tea party. Perhaps understanding this notion, Claudia quietly took a sip of her tea with a deeply annoyed expression on her beautiful face, and said, So what do you want from me for having invited me here? Cyril's glad he didn't have to make some pleasantries, as he himself had no intention of making idle chit-chat, so he spoke briefly of his reasons for calling Claudia. Let me borrow your dress. Claudia was silent for a full ten seconds as she lifted her cup of tea. During this time, she didn't even blink, which made Cyril feel uneasy, as if he was talking to a wax figure. After having fully stirred up her brother's anxiety, Claudia said a few words. Comma I had no idea my dear brother had a thing for cross-dressing, Cyril felt the urge to shout, but he held it in and said with a twitch in his cheek. Why is it assumed that I'm going to wear it, oh, you haven't heard? Well, according to the voting held in the school secretly to decide the suitable person for the heroine of the festival play, the first Queen Amelia, Bridget Grant got the first place as a result, and you came in second, what? He had never heard any of it. Sitting across from Cyril, who was in utter disbelief, Claudia smiled a meaningful and eerie smile that stirred up anxiety in the viewer. For your information, I got the third place. To be honest, I'm not even happy to be ranked in such a thing, but I couldn't stop laughing when I saw your name and mine lined up in second and third place, smiled Claudia beautifully but emotionlessly. Cyril, who had no idea that such a vote was being held in secret, gritted his teeth. Well, whatever the result of the vote. Student council members like Bridget and Cyril can't afford to be there on stage, and Claudia would never be in the play given her personality. In the end, Miss Elian, who was placed fourth, was chosen to play the role of Queen. Elian is a distant relative of Felix from his mother's side, and is one of the three most beautiful women in the school, along with Bridget and Claudia. Though she was somewhat of a dreamy, delicate, and fleeting girl, it would be another matter whether she was suitable for the role of Queen Amelia, which was a strong, noble, and wise woman. Comma so, could you tell me your reason for asking me to borrow my dress? After having given many sarcastic remarks to her brother, Claudia returned to the topic at hand with an indifferent look on her face. Cyril himself did not want to continue with the current topic, so he cleared his throat lightly and told her the circumstances. Well, you see, I hope you could lend your dress to Treasurer Norton. Students are expected to wear formal attire when attending the ball at the end of the school festival. Since no one participates in school uniform. However, given Monica's circumstances and personality, we can safely assume that she didn't own any dress. And as a member of the student council, she could not afford to be absent from the ball. If Treasurer Norton were to attend a ball in school uniform, it would be a disgrace to our student council, or in other words, to His Highness. And it's my duty as His Highness's right-hand man to make arrangements in advance so as not to embarrass His Highness. Students can borrow a dress from one of their classmates, so what I heard, at Claudia's remark, Cyril stiffened for a moment, then drank his tea with a rather restless gesture but then snorted haughtily. Then, my request won't be a problem for you, yes, of course it will, there's no way my dress would fit on Monica, though it would look much better on you, the height difference between the tall Claudia even for a girl, and the petite Monica was too great. If anything, Cyril, who was slender despite being a boy, was closer to Claudia's size. In secret. Cyril was disturbed by this notion as a blue streak popped up on his temple, but he kept his expression as if nothing happened before opening the lid of the sugar pot. Claudia watched him impassively and said, You know, I've been wondering, what's made my dear brother, who would prefer death than having a tea party with me, had invited me to his tea party. I see, now I understand, I told you. 
This is to ensure the success of the school festival. You must have really wanted to see Monica in a dress. The spoon and sugar inside the sugar pot spilled over into Cyril's teacup. But when the spoon almost dropped into the cup, he hurriedly put the spoon back into the sugar pot and glared at Claudia. A student council member is a role model for all students. That's why I've made the necessary arrangements so to uphold that goal. Claudia was no longer listening to Cyril as she took a bite of the cookie with a look of deep concern on her face. But when she looked at the vase of flowers on the table, she suddenly remembered something. That reminds me, is Neil, why does the name of General Affairs Manager Maywood come up here? What's wrong with me talking about my own fiancé? So, will Neil be busy this year? Of course he will. On the day of the festival, Felix was probably the busiest person on the surface since he's to greet everyone. But if you think who's the busiest person behind the scenes, it was actually General Affairs Manager Neil. Managing supplies, arranging meals, and so on, and when there are problems that arise, he had to deal with them. Moreover, there are many other things to do, such as keeping in close contact with the heads of each department before sharing all those information with the student council members. Once Cyril affirmed the obvious, Claudia lowered her long eyelashes and let out a sigh with a slightly depressed look on her face. Comma I see. I guess I won't get any flower this year either, flower? Oh, you mean the custom giving floral ornaments, at Serendia Academy, there's a custom of boys giving flower ornaments to girls during the school festival. A flower ornament represents the expression of I want you to be the first to dance with me at the ball. And if the girl who received the ornament wore it, it meant that she had accepted the invitation to dance. The colors of the flowers and ribbons were often the same as the color of the giver's hair and eyes, so those who look at them can easily tell who gave them to them. Though it's not a mandatory event, most of the people who participated actually have already been engaged. Comma I didn't dance with Neil at the ball last year, Maywood General Affairs Manager is a very busy man. After all, and I didn't even get a floral ornament, what does it matter? Flower ornaments are just an event for fun, Claudia tilted her head slightly with a doll-like blank expression. Her beautiful lapis lazuli eyes looked at her brother in a somewhat content manner. Comma you don't understand woman's heart at all, Cyril fell silent, and Claudia mumbled to herself, hardly moving her mouth. Comma do you know how a girl who hasn't received a floral ornament is looked at? A leftover who is not taken in by anyone that's just their assumptions. At least on the boy's side, they don't look at girls that way, exactly, even if the boys don't think so, the girls just take it upon themselves to make assumptions about each other, deceitful, isn't it? Cyril gulped as he felt the chill in Claudia's voice that sent shivers down his spine. Then he opened his mouth to cover up the fact that he was pressured by his sister. But, you, you'd received floral ornaments from a dozen people at last year's school festival. Despite the fact that she has a fiancé named Neil, there were always a number of people who come forward every year to claim that they are worthy of being Claudia's fiancé. Claudia's overwhelming beauty and brains must be coveted by those who want excellent and beautiful children. That's why the direct bloodline of the Marcus Hyen household is highly regarded even within the kingdom. Those who think that they are more suitable to be Claudia's husband than the son of a humble baronet will flock to Claudia with flower ornaments on the day of the school festival. Dot. I would never accept flowers from anyone but Neil. Claudia looked at Cyril with a look of deep contempt. Giving him a look of you should not make me say something that is so obvious now. Cyril felt slightly awkward and cleared his throat. General Affairs Manager Maywood is an honest man. The only reason he didn't send you a floral ornament is probably that he was too busy to dance that day. Claudia probably knew that, too. I guess so, she muttered shortly, her lapis lazuli eyes looking idly outside. And then, as if talking to herself, she murmured. Actually, I neither like nor dislike you. But, now, that's out of the blue, if I had to pick one, I'd say I like Neil, 
Cyril snorted haughtily and took a sip of his sweet tea. It's just that their eyes are too blind to see the capabilities of General Affairs Manager Maywood. Yes, they are, muttered Claudia in an unusual gentle voice. As he sipped his tea, Cyril thought of a certain girl. Student Council Treasurer Monica Norton was the cause of Cyril's concern. Does she also want a flower ornament from someone? Would she be feeling miserable if no one gave her a flower ornament? No, I doubt Treasurer Norton would want to dance in the first place. Cyril's concerns were unfounded, of course. Monica, who hated to be seen in public and was not good at dance, would hardly want to dance at a ball. The day before the school festival, Monica Norton arrived at the student council room, but she seemed to be acting strangely. She suddenly flapped her clothes on the spot and performed a bizarre step. Comet Treasurer Norton, what are you doing? Cyril gave her a stare, and Monica stiffly responded with a smile. W well, you see. I, right, I'm practicing ballroom dance for the upcoming ball. I am looking forward to the ball. Those words shocked Cyril from the bottom of his heart. That treasurer Norton was interested in the dance. Not only was she interested in dancing, but she was also looking forward to it. He had thought she would never be interested in the ball, but, could it be, no wait, come to think of it, Monica was wearing makeup on the day of the chess tournament. Maybe she has become interested in those things that normal girls like to do. That in and of itself was not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, but, why did he feel bothered? And so much of it. As if to deceive his bewilderment, Cyril raised his eyebrows and stared at Monica. Comma you're not going to tell me that those bizarre steps are a dance, are you? What were those training days for, I I? Oh oh of course I remember. Look, one two three, one two three, after saying that. Monica tried to do some dance steps on the spot. It was a terrible step. The steps he taught her a while ago were a little better. Ah, now I understand. Cyril realized what was bothering him. If Monica performed badly at the dance ball, it would be a disgrace to the student council. The thought of it had made him feel uneasy. That's why it bothered him so much. That must be it. It had to be. Therefore. He thought of a simple solution. If I or His Highness take the lead, Treasurer Norton's dance will be a little better, but I can't trouble His Highness with this, so it's only logical for me to look after her. So Cyril concluded, and the fuzziness in his chest cleared up. But he didn't seem to notice, that Neil was looking at him strangely as he began to work in a very good mood. Extra Story 7 in the land of the North Azareth GT Silent Witch September 26, 2021 10 minutes as a high-ranking wind spirit, Lynn's flight spell works by moving a semi-spherical barrier she created. To put it another way, it's like riding in a small invisible carriage, which is why it can move several people at once. And now, sitting on one knee in such semi-spherical barrier that moving through the sky was Lewis Miller silently reading a book. At first glance, he may look like a strange person reading a book hovering in midair while moving at high speed, but there's no one using flight spell in the vicinity, and fortunately, only the birds in the sky were watching this scene. It would take several hours to reach their destination, even with Lynn's flight spell. The ever-busy Lewis didn't like to waste time, so he used the travel time to read. You sure read some imposing book, Sir Lewis. Whom do you intend to curse and kill, while keeping her body facing forward to maintain the flight barrier? Lynn turned her head around to look at Lewis. Lynn may have been trying to imitate human gestures, but to Lewis, it looked like an owl turning its head. To put it simply, it was uncanny. This is not some sort of spell book. And keep in mind that I don't curse people I don't like. I beat them up directly, that book doesn't seem to be written in this country's language, it's a book written by the Empire, after all, after saying that, Lewis flipped through the pages. What he was reading now was a book concerning medical spell, a subject that was banned and restricted in this country. 
This book was also not allowed to be taken out by the general public, but he had taken it out with the authority of the Seven Sages. Lin, I assume you have seen with your own eyes the assassin who broke into the chess tournament, indeed, did the assassin who was pretending to be Eugene Pittman use any kind of illusion? Lin was silent for a moment as she thought about it, and then did the dexterous trick of shaking her head in a position with her head still turned back. No, that assassin might be a magician, but he didn't use any kind of illusion. The guards who had arrested the assassins had also confirmed this, so there was no doubt about it. After all, using an illusion spell to create some deceptive image in the surrounding was very inefficient, in terms of mana usage. Lewis himself may be able to maintain the illusion for a few tens of seconds, but to constantly maintain the illusion for several hours is first and foremost impossible with the amount mana humans have. The only beings who are capable of impersonating others through illusion are those high-ranking water spirits who are good at this kind of spell. And the assassin who killed Eugene Pittman was not a spirit, but a human. As Lewis held the page he was reading with his fingers and fixed his misaligned monocle, he muttered to himself. The way that man impersonated Eugene Pittman, it was neither an impersonator nor a disguise. It wasn't any kind of illusion as well. The only thing I can think of is, body manipulation spell. Body manipulation spell refers to the art of pouring mana into a person's body to strengthen or change the body. Originally. The purpose of this spell was to heal damaged bodies, such as returning altered organs to their normal form, but if it could transform damaged organs and skin, it would not be impossible to change the shape of a face. However, body manipulation spell is considered forbidden magic, except in one country. Body manipulation spell has been lifted as part of medical magic in the Empire. If that's the case, there's a good chance that the assassin, is someone from the Empire, Casey Groove's attempted assassination of the Second Prince using the Quang Flame, was related to the Randall Kingdom, a small country between the Riddle Kingdom and the Empire. And the assassin at the chess tournament had shown him the tale of the shadow of the Empire. These two incidents that occurred in such a short period of time caused Lewis to develop certain concerns. And to ascertain it, he had come all the way to the frigid north. The scenery spread out below was speckled with white. A chilly wind may still be blowing in the capital, but in this area, snow has already begun to fall. And in the middle of the snow-covered mountains, far from human habitation, laid an old monastery on slightly open land. Sir Lewis, I've come up with an innovative landing method unique to this land, may I try it? Hearing that suggestion from the beautiful maid. Lewis frowned before glaring at Lin. You want to release your flight spell and Madarin use the snow as a cushion to land on, it's as you say, are you a child who gets excited by snow? Stick to the safe landing, oh, that's a shame, Lin responded with an impassive expression that didn't look the least bit disappointed, and slowly lowered her altitude. In front of the monastery, a young sister was shoveling snow with a shovel in her hand. The sister was not surprised to see Lewis coming down from the sky. She just held her hands over her eyes to look at Lewis and Lynn. Landing quietly on the snow, Lewis stared back at the sister who was looking at him, then gave her a now, that's a surprise response with a thin smile. I thought you were a very composed sister who wasn't surprised to see flight magic, but, it was you, huh? I guess compared to the shock of crashing into the ground while spinning, it's kind of cute. Having said that, the daughter of Count Bright, Casey Groove, thrust her shovel into the snow at her feet. The elderly sister in charge of the monastery ordered Casey to show Lewis and the others around and then retreated into the chapel, wanting nothing to do with them. For these women who live away from the world, visitors from the outside, especially a man like Lewis, are probably not welcomed. The same seemed to be true for Casey, as she began to talk after having guided Lewis and Lynn into the parlor without offering them any tea. So, what do you want from me? I think I've told you pretty much everything I can, 
Lewis responded to Casey's brusque attitude with a mature smile. There's something I wanted to ascertain, our people had nothing to do with that assassination attempt. It was something my father and I did on our own, you could believe whatever you think, at least, although your father seems to think otherwise. Casey's mouth quivered at Lewis' indirect remark. Lewis took out a wrap cloth from his pocket and gently unfolded it on the table. What lay within the cloth were the remnants of red stones of various sizes. Do you recognize what this is, the remnants of the, quang flame, I used? Instead of correcting her, Lewis smiled and continued with his words. Your father claimed to have bought it from a traveling peddler. But I suspect that someone from the Randall Kingdom gave it to your father. Are you saying that the people of Randall had instigated my father? Do you have any idea how much the Quang Flame costs? Forgive me, but it's not something the not so wealthy Count Bright can easily afford. Magical tools can be very costly. And with a high level of perfection at that, it's not something that the Count Bright household can easily get their hands on. When there are so many cheaper ways to assassinate someone, why did Count Bright choose the Quang Flame? It's more plausible to believe that someone gave Count Bright the Quang Flame and instigated him to do so. Casey was probably thinking about this possibility too. As she bit her lip with a grim face and tried her best to contain her agitation so that she would not say anything that could be used against her father. Looking at the resilient figure, Lewis picked up one of the pieces of red stone and held it up to the light. The ruby used in this, Quang Flame, is extremely pure. I had it authenticated by an expert, and he said that it must have come from Glocken. Glocken, you haven't heard of it? It's a mine in the southeastern part of the empire. The amount of our mine is not very large, but it yields high-quality rubies that are ideal for making magical tools. But the Empire exports very little of the ore from the said mine, so it's difficult to find on the market. Lewis put the red stone back on the table with a clatter. The ringing sound echoed rather loudly in the serene monastery. Lewis narrowed his grey purple eyes and looked at Casey. The Quang Flame, that Count Bright entrusted to you is made in the Empire. Do you know what this implies? Casey immediately turned pale at those words. Clever girl. With that single statement, she speculated one frightening possibility. If the person who gave Count Bright the Quang Flame was assumed to be someone from Randall, the next question would be where did the Randall person get the Empire's Quang Flame? This brought her to one hypothesis. And that was. It's possible that the Randall Kingdom and the Empire are working together behind the scenes. A war between the Riddle Kingdom and the Allied forces of the Empire and the Randall Kingdom could very well happen in the future. Casey must have finally understood this realization, as she clenched her fists tightly in her lap, but then opened her mouth with her head lowered. Come as far as I know, I've never seen anyone from the Empire entering or leaving my hometown. The only people who frequented my household were Randall nobles whose names even I knew. Have you ever seen of your father sending letters to the Empire? No, I see. It would have been nice to get some evidence of the connection to the Empire here, but from her testimony, that was not going to be that easy. If the Empire and Randall were somehow tied together, the Empire, with its overwhelming national power, would obviously be the master of the Master-Slave Alliance. There was also a possibility that the nobles of the far end of Randall were unaware of the relationship between their country and the Empire. There's no end to the what-ifs, but it's always better to remain cautious of the shadow of the Empire. I guess there's no more information I can squeeze out of you. Since there seems to be no sign of tea being served, I guess I will take my leave soon. As Lewis rose from his chair, Casey gave him a short word of wait to stop him. Lewis turned his disinterested eyes to Casey. He was a fairly busy person and disliked wasting his time. And he didn't think he could have anything more meaningful to say to this girl. Comma is Monica doing well, sure enough, what Casey mentioned was not something worthwhile for Lewis. That's a topic that's less important than the weather if I would say. Well, 
She's been caught up in a fight with an assassin recently, but still living vigorously, more or less. Casey gulped, widened her eyes at the mention of having fought an assassin. Comma I still can't believe it, honestly. I can't believe Monica is the Seven Sages. I mean, she just seemed like a normal girl, a silent witch, is a normal girl, Lewis couldn't help but chuckle. Even after seeing Monica use no chant magic, Casey still didn't have a clear understanding of Monica. Lewis sat back in his chair and gave a cruelly beautiful sneer. Do you remember the Black Dragon of Wogan incident six months ago? Yeah, silent witch. I mean Monica had chased away the Black Dragon that appeared in Count Kerbeck's territory. Count Kerbeck's territory and Count Bright's territory are relatively close to each other, so that incident was probably no stranger to her. Even more so when the Black Dragon was an existence that gave despair to her people. The flames breathed out by the Black Dragon, or, Black Flame, were unusual flames that burn away even magical barriers. Even for Lewis, who's also known as the Dragon Slayer, dealing with that incident was not a simple matter. I was the one who dragged Miss, Silent Witch, to defeat the Black Dragon. You see. That little girl was whimpering and saying, scary, scary, when I did so, Casey looked at Lewis in astonishment as he blithely confessed his outrageous deed. Don't you feel that way too? Yet, yeah, I have some fears, too, you know. But what do you think Monica Everett, the silent witch, was afraid of, at that time, in a sobbing voice, Monica said to Lewis, those people of Dragon Knight so scary. Surrounded by so many people I don't know, so scary, is what she said. That little girl was never even a little bit afraid of the black dragon. She, the, silent witch, of the seven sages, was afraid of the dragon knights, humans who came to defeat it. It's quite funny, isn't it? Lewis whispered, but Casey seemed stunned into silence. Looking at her reaction, Lewis cast a pitying glance at Casey. She fears and hates humans from the bottom of her heart, and that's why she can be as cruel as it takes. She's more twisted and heartless than you think, that's why Lewis chose Monica as his helper in the mission to escort the second prince. Don't expect her to have any sympathy for you, Lewis told him sarcastically, and Casey stood up from her chair with a clatter. Then stormed out of the room, before quickly returning with a mug and a small package in her hand. Casey slammed a mug of tea down in front of Lewis and pushed the paper package to him. I've been hesitating whether to give this to her or not, but your words have made up my mind. Please give this to Monica. You don't have to mention my name. Lewis didn't ask about her consent but when he looked at the contents of the paper package, his eyes widened. Casey must have been very upset with what Lewis had said since she's been glaring at Lewis with sharp eyes. It would be easier if you hated her. What a foolish and soft-hearted girl. Lewis let out a sigh in secret and tucked the paper package into his pocket. He then sipped his mug of tea with an elegant gesture and said, I suppose I'll do enough work for this cup of tea. By the way, do you have any sugar or jam? Extra story 8. A letter from my mother Azareth GT silent which December 18th, 2021 6 minutes. To my dearest mother the weather here was so frigid in recent days and most parts of our dormitory have been covered in ice. Because of it, His Highness clothes are getting thicker and I was spending my days practicing to control my magic so that he won't feel cold because of me. This year, I was able to choose advanced practical magic as my elective course. For your information. Advanced practical magic can only be taken by those who have achieved excellent grades in the two subjects of basic magic and practical magic. However, I am very honored to have been recommended by my teacher and able to take the course successfully. I will devote myself day by day to eventually become a person who will not embarrass Marcus Hyannis his successor. Speaking of which, the Serendia School Festival season is approaching. I'm aware you're so busy, but I wish you could visit by. Marcus Hyen also said that he would provide us with a carriage. Since this will be my last school festival, 
I will try my best to help His Highness, the Student Council President, in his wonderful leadership, in the hope you can enjoy the school festival as well. Please take care of yourself, since the weather is getting colder lately. Also, I received chocolates made with the latest technology the other day. It tastes very good and warms you up when you melt it in milk. I have included the package in the letter so you can try it out yourself. From your son, there was a carriage pulling away from Serendia Academy, which was celebrating its school festival. The carriage was not ornately decorated, but it was well made and carried the flag of Marcus Hyen, one of the most prestigious noble families in the kingdom. In such a carriage, Myra Wayne sat with a shrinking body. Myra was an ordinary woman in her mid-thirties. Her appearance which belonged to a commoner was hardly adequate to fit into this magnificent carriage. She was aware of this, so she sat hunched over, trying to reduce her presence in the carriage as much as possible. The carriage was comfortable to ride in. It was incomparable to the cheap carriages on the streets. Even so, Myra couldn't help but feel her face tense. Sitting across from Myra was a middle-aged man with dark hair and a mustache. A man of much higher status than Myra, Marcus Hyen. To Myra, the fact that they were even now riding in the same carriage was hard to believe. Marcus Hyen opened his mouth while playing with his mustache as Myra looked at him with trepidation. To be honest, I never thought you'd ask me to bring you to attend a school festival. I didn't mean to imply that you'd be a nuisance, Marcus stopped Myra, who reflexively tried to apologize with a wave of his hand. Myra has a habit of saying, I am sorry, I am sorry, regardless of whether she is at fault or not. Her habit came from her late husband who would abuse her and raise his hand whenever he didn't like her. That's why Myra's gaze is always hovering around her feet, and if she looks up once in a while, she will unconsciously see someone else's face. Even so, while Myra was looking at the complexion of him, Marcus continued his words with his blue eyes slightly down. I see you're having difficulty dealing with Cyril, the Marcus words struck her heart really hard. Myra's face contorted into tears, and she covered her face with her hands. Comma yeah, that's right. That boy was just too, much like his father, Myra's late husband might have shared the blood of the Hyan family, but it didn't mean its prestige would be shared down to him. And yet. He insisted that he was a member of that noble family. As a result, he became isolated from his surroundings, lost his job, and ended up drowning in alcohol before his death. And Myra herself has always been unable to stand having a son who looks so much like her late husband. Every time he proudly told me that he received the highest grade in school, I felt afraid he would end up like his father, perhaps. Cyril just wanted her compliment ever since he was young. He wanted her to praise him well done, you did a great job, however, Myra was unable to say even such a commonplace compliment. She had a feeling that if she complimented him, he would grow up and become a proud person like his father. Comma I'm not expecting him to have a good grade. I just want him to be normal like the others. But Cyril was a brilliant and hardworking person. He kept striving, believing that if he worked harder, his mother would surely praise him. Eventually, Marcus Hyen recognized his achievement, offered him financial support and adoption. At that time Cyril must have thought, I'm sure my mother will praise me for this. However, Myra pushed Cyril away. Comma I knew it, you really are from a noble family. Myra still can't forget the hurt look on Cyril's face when she said those words to him. Lord Marcus, you asked me why did I ask you to bring me to the school festival when I have been stubbornly refusing to see Cyril? The truth is, I was planning to see his face for the last time today, and never see him again after. Myra knew what kind of life her son was leading because she received letters from Cyril every month. Cyril who was chosen as the second Princess aide and became the vice president of the student council, was living a fulfilling student life. He had been behaving in a manner befitting a child of a noble family. People around him also expect him to do so. 
Cyril was living as a respectable nobleman. And as a commoner mother like herself, she shouldn't get involved with him anymore. Commoner Somira thought to herself. Today, I met a simple and docile girl, she complimented him a lot, and told me how kind he is. To think a girl like that had complimented Cyril so earnestly, Myra sniffed once before squeezing out a faint voice. She even told me that the flower in her possession was given by him. Each time Myra was crying after being abused by her late husband, the young Cyril always picked up a flower for her and said, Mother, please don't cry. Look at this beautiful flower. I'm sure you will feel better after looking at this. Cyril had always tried his best to please his mother in any way he could. And yet, Myra always rejected Cyril and never responded to any of his letters. Even the chocolate package he had sent to her a while ago hadn't been opened yet. Comma so when I heard that girl speak about Cyril, I finally realized. I had been too afraid to face the true nature of my son after having been haunted by the face of my late husband. The Marcus glanced at the downcast Myra and muttered to himself. Since we first met, Cyril has been the kind of boy who craves approval. That's why he is so ambitious. Even when he realized that he was no match for Claudia, he didn't slack down but started learning magic to acquire his own unique weapon instead. By the time Marcus realized his tendency to push himself too hard, Cyril had already developed a constitution that absorbed mana abnormally after overworking his body in training. Cyril was so afraid at that time, thinking that he would be abandoned by the Marcus family. Of course, Marcus didn't intend to do that, so he asked the seven sages to create a brooch to discharge his excess mana. He may still be inexperienced, but he is diligent, hardworking, and ambitious. I expect him to follow in my footsteps in the future, thank you so much, but that doesn't mean I'm going to forbid him to see you, his own mother. Though I would let him if he wants to visit his birthplace, Cyril is always hesitant when I told him so. I guess he is still afraid that you will reject him, Myra swallowed her words and Marcus said in a calm tone. You should write him a letter. The sooner you repair your relationship, the better. After arriving home, Myra draped her stole over the back of her chair and pulled out a package of chocolates that she had kept in the cupboard. Carefully opening the seal, she followed the instructions in the letter to prepare the chocolate. The chocolate tasted sweet and delicious. Its soft sweetness evoked her old memories. Mother, why does that man always hit you, Cyril? You shouldn't refer to your father as that man, but, I don't understand. If I were him I would never raise my hand to someone I care about. I mean, if I see someone I cared about was crying or depressed I would make them something sweet and tasty to drink, right? If you ever find a girl you like, I'm sure you'll do it for her, sipping a bit of the warm, sweet-smelling chocolate. Myra carefully scribbled out the words on the letterhead. If you have time during winter break, please come back home. I'll make you your favorite stew. Also, I would love to hear about your school life. From your mother. P.S. Thank you for the chocolate. It was delicious. Extra Story 9. Then? As Earth GT Silent which December 19, 2021 7 minutes the sunset had sunk to the horizon and the evening sky was beginning to fade into the colors of the night. The faint remnants of the setting sun cast a silhouette of a slender man on the roof of the boys' dormitory of Serendia Academy. Sneeze Lewis Miller was sitting there, quivering in the blowing north wind, blowing his nose. He, who came to the school festival to support Monica Everett the Silent Witch, was now in the middle of guarding the second prince on her behalf. Just as he had predicted. The assassin from the chess tournament has reappeared at the school after the latter used a body manipulation spell to disguise himself as a student of the school. Realizing in the nick of time, Monica engaged the assassins in battle. In the end, the assailant made her inhale poison, resulting in her being unable to move for the time being. Although Monica's familiar seemed to have gone to her rescue on his own, there was not much he could do as a familiar. So Lewis had no choice but to send Lynn to help Monica. 
If it were possible, he would like to pursue the assassins, but since the second prince was safe, he changed his priority to provide protection for Silent Witch. They couldn't afford to lose a talent like her in a place like this. That is how much Lewis Miller values the talent of Monica Everett the Silent Witch. Sir Lewis, I have returned. A beautiful woman in a maid uniform softly landed on the roof. Her appearance without a cloak gave off a sense of frigidity, but as a high-ranking wind spirit, Lynn did not feel any cold. After dispelling his mana sensing, Lewis erected a barrier to block wind and cold air, took out a small bottle of liquor from his pocket, and gulped down the contents. There's no better way to warm up a cold body quickly than with strong liquor. Letting out a breath that reeked of alcohol, Lewis turned his eyes to Lynn. How's Monica's condition? She is suffering from a minor illness. She said she would continue to attend the evening ball after this. In that case, I may as well be going now. I've made Rosalie waiting in the carriage already, while security is necessary even at a ball. Honestly speaking, not many people would dare to try to kill the second prince at a ball. The fact that all the students were gathered in one place makes the security much tighter, making a crowded place unsuitable for assassination. But I wonder what the purpose of the assassins was. If their goal was to assassinate the second prince, there were easier ways to do it. The only thing they did was approach the second prince in disguise. Although he had used his mana sensing to search the entire school. There was no indication that anything had been tampered with at the school. Lynn, you're listening in on the conversation between the assassin and Monica, weren't you? Didn't the assassin say anything about their purpose? Yes, they were talking about something. It was. Lynn nodded her head and replayed the conversation she had heard in an inexpressive voice. Kama have you confirmed that matters yet? I've confirmed it at a close range while pretending to be getting rid of a spider that latched on him. It's the work of the traitor Arthur. That person's prediction was right, that's all, confirming at close range? The traitor Arthur, the name Arthur was commonly used by people from the Empire. Therefore, it would be reasonable to assume that the assassins were people affiliated with the Empire. Then again. Why would someone from the Empire have gone through the trouble for approaching the second prince? And, who is the traitor Arthur? Don't tell me. One hypothesis ran through Lewis' mind. It was too far-fetched and ridiculous to even consider. But if this were true, it would make sense given the fact that the Star Oracle Witch was no longer able to read the fate of the second prince. Has His Majesty been dimly aware of this? Which is why he sent me here, to catch their tails. However, this hypothesis was not something one could rashly inquire about to the king. If he's not careful, Lewis' head will be sent flying for impudence. Firstly, he needed to validate this hypothesis. And to complete it, he must. The question is whether or not there is a person named Arthur around the second prince. And perhaps that person will be the key in this situation. If Lewis' hypothesis is correct, this case will be a major event that will shake the whole kingdom. Lewis cupped his hand over his mouth, letting out QQQ voices. Sir Lewis, your face looks like a villain plotting his evil scheme. Now that's rude, to even call me a villain. It's just, the thought of Duke Crockford's downfall just made me smile with delight. If his assumption is proved to be true, Duke Crockford will be destroyed along with the second prince. He has no reason to show mercy, as he has no favorable feelings for them. But I think it would be best to keep this a secret from that little girl, she's a little too easily moved by emotion. There was no telling how Monica would react if she found out that the second prince would be doomed. Therefore. It would be appropriate to keep this speculation under wraps until the last minute. Serendia Academy will soon enter its winter break. The second prince will be returning to the palace during that period, and Monica's escort duties will come to halt. While Monica takes a break, I may as well do some digging on the person named Arthur. A few days later after the Serendia school festival, 
While Lewis was working on paperwork in his study at home, Lynn knocked on the door of his room. Excuse me for my intrusion. With that, Lynn stepped into the room carrying a tray of tea sets in her hands, and an owl on her head. Right, an own on her head. As Lewis positioned his shifting monocle and stared above Lynn's head, the latter placed the tea set on the side table in a very natural gesture. I've brought you some tea, what's that bird? It landed on my head while I was cleaning the garden. I'm thinking of naming it and raising it for myself, though he wanted to retort. Soon Lewis noticed the anklet on the owl's leg. It was an anklet bearing a crest in the shape of a star. Lynn, give up on keeping that owl at all. It's a familiar of star oracle which, attached to the anklet of the owl was a small tube to hold the letter. Taking a small rolled up letter from the owl's anklet perched on Lynn's head, Lewis unfolded it. Comma according to the results of the star reading, there are signs of dragon damage in the near future. The seven sages should be prepared for emergencies. Disasters caused by dragons, known as dragon damage, are not that uncommon in this country. Whether it's a herd of small herbivorous dragons destroying fields or a large dragon attacking people or livestock, dragon damage is an everyday occurrence in the eastern part of the Riddle Kingdom. But the fact that the Star Oracle Witch sent a message to warn him, a wicked dragon, or maybe a cursed dragon will appear, among the dragons, there's a particular dragon that has intelligence and is harmful to people called wicked dragon, and a dragon, regardless of its intelligence, spreads some kind of curse in its surroundings called cursed dragon. Both of these dragons are extremely dangerous. Disasters caused by wicked dragons and cursed dragons are of a different order of magnitude in terms of damage. One wrong move and the country could be destroyed. Kama looks like there will be no winter break for the seven sages. Among the seven sages, the three with the highest combat abilities are Cannon Magician, Barrier Magician, and the least known Silent Witch. The remaining four are not really suited for combat. Because of it, the three combat-oriented individuals would be sent to fight. I was hoping to spend the winter break with Rosalie. As Lewis sighed, Lynn grabbed the owl above her head with both hands and began to stare closely at it. The owl was completely frightened by this. Dot. Lynn, please stop threatening other people's familiar. I'm not threatening it, I'm simply observing it. Does this owl speak human language? What? Lewis wrinkled his brow and gave Lynn a small, mocking look. It's not a parrot. How can an owl speak human languages? Doesn't a familiar have the ability to understand human language? It seems that Lynn didn't know much about familiars. To begin with, familiars are not something people see very often, so it's not surprising. Good grief, exhaling a sigh of exasperation, Lewis crossed his legs and leaned his back against the back of the chair. Familiars may understand simple words, but they can't speak human language. They are somewhat smarter than normal animals, but in the end, they are still animals. A familiar is an animal that has been given a share of mana through a master-servant relationship with a magician. Therefore, they can only understand simple commands from a magician, but even then, what they can do is still limited to that of an animal. That is why whenever a person wants to send a message, it is necessary to attach a letter in its anklet. Compared to a contracted spirit, it may require less magical power, but the range of what it can do is far less. After hearing Lewis' explanation, Lynn fell silent, still holding on to the owl. This was rare for this self-based spirit to be so confused about something. Lynn made a thoughtful gesture and then looked at Lewis with eyes that were more emotionless than the owl. Then, can a familiar turn into a human being? Read novels, or sing merrily saying yay, I'm the best, how can there be such a familiar in the first place? You yourself know very well that it takes a lot of mana for a non-human to turn into a human. The only ones who can change into humans are spirits or higher beings, Lynn stared at the owl with a blank expression and cocked her head. Then, 